well afford it. But I'm all good. Joe, the river into the gum lard and the way Oh, 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 an ambassador, a couple of fucking guys, yeah. So. Uh, Kiapas and her fish the gum. Uh, right egg and the row in the ilga. Feel why not on a hash point now, Misha, are in the gilt of the. There's a particularly complex ritual involved in invoking the tutelary gods in what is a triply eponymous occasion. Patrick McGill, John Hume, and Seamus Heaney. And I hope I can do them and the occasion justice. The McGill Summer School, thanks to the tireless efforts of Joe Mulholland and many distinguished contributors over the years, has established McGill in the canon of Irish writing and the school as a fixed annual point in the Irish cultural landscape. John Hume and Seamus Heaney are more immediate and more personal, both having been good friends for many years, giants in their different spheres, but overlapping in so many ways. Near contemporaries at St. Columns, both masters of language and rhetoric, with the same broad humanity and compassion, the same innate sense of justice and of the rightness of things, both their own men, both of them gregarious, and solitary. John Hume, in the politics of the last half century, is seen through the prism of history, will, I believe, be rated as one of the great Irish constitutional politicians in the mould of O'Connell, with whom he shared a lifelong abhorrence of violence in Parnell. And indeed, now that it's possible to mention him without derision in polite society, John Redmond. He is, without question, the moving and conceptual genius of what has become known, often with bizarre claims to ownership, as the peace process. All the seminal ideas were his. From an early stage, he drew out the geometry of a settlement, the three strands which needed to be spun out and then woven together to be affirmed north and south by synchronized simultaneous referenda. It was he who put together the vital coalitions and networks of interest in the United States and Europe and had the courage and the vision to draw militant republicanism into dialogue and ultimately into engagement in the political process, knowing the potential risk to himself and to his party, while all the time maintaining his inflexible commitment to nonviolence. Like Martin Luther King, whom he admired and rivaled in rhetoric, Hume never lost sight of the ultimate goal of a better and fairer life for all in a settled society marked by the embrace of diversity, toleration of difference and mutual respect. His concept of a united Ireland involved uniting people rather than territory, and his practical common sense came through in his repetition of his father's mantra, you can't eat a flag. Like all great leaders, he was essentially a teacher, articulating a vision of the way ahead as much by iteration as by passion. Hence, the single transferable speech, so often mildly derided by friends and colleagues. The program for the week's discussions, and like any respectable bardic school, we must have a garden school, a call to arms, which sets out the context and the issues for debate. The one for this non school sends dire signals of impending disaster, which, though timely and well directed, are a bit too apocalyptic for my taste. Things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Who knows what sort of beast is slouching towards Glenties to be born? <laughs> <laughs> People might be dissatisfied with the government and politicians. Bad decisions have been made, or no decisions at all. But the answer to poor governance is not no government. Of all the archies, anarchy is the worst in being arbitrary, cruel, and unpredictable and unaccountable. 
It's what Hannah Arendt called in another context, government by nobody. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that the state of the nation does indeed give cause for concern, or we wouldn't be here discussing it and prepared to spend the rest of the week doing so. There is turbulence in markets, nationally and internationally. In many spheres, a period of rapid change, with old moulds being broken and loss of faith in institutions, which were historic pillars of society, the church, the banks, the trade unions, the law, and loss of faith, too, in the ability to run our own affairs without the assistance of the Troika. Disillusionment with politicians and their conduct of affairs. And finally, the looming danger of loss of faith in politics, apathy, and in the ultimate complete disengagement. At which stage we might remember that in the original Greek, the idiot, idiotes, was the solitary person who didn't take part in public affairs. There is, too, a distinct vacuum of leadership in important areas of national life, with commanding heights being occupied by lesser, less certain, and less articulate people. Not much passionate intensity there, even from the worst. With respective leaders being subjected to corrosive scrutiny and the concept of leadership itself derided by the new levellers. Meanwhile, as Milton had it, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. And all the while, governments are faced with the atomization of society, the breakdown of community cohesion, changes in modes of communication and mobilization, and a rapidly secularizing society. And with no recognizable set of values apart from consumerist self-interest to put in the place of those being jettisoned. It is a time, too, when power is being leached from governments by huge multinational corporations and parastatal organizations and the functioning of poorly regulated markets. The problem for governments anywhere in economic cycles characterized by boom and bust is that the measures they have to take to balance the books and stabilize the economy essentially make them unelectable next time round. I think it was Jean-Claude Juncker, not usually the most quotable of men, who said, we know what to do, but we don't know how to get elected afterwards. <laughs> the present government, it has to be said, has done a decent job in dealing with economic collapse and a banking crisis and chronic overspending by getting the deficit down and the national finances more nearly into kilter while emerging timelessly from the bailout. Maybe they threw caps in the air too soon after the exit of the Troika, conveying the impression to an electorate which had remained remarkably stoical that discipline and public spending was no longer an imperative or the need to tailor the provision of public services more nearly to the capacity to pay for them without borrowing. They would do well to remember de Tocqueville's dictum and the revolution of raising expectations, that it is not when things are at their worst that people are most discontented, but when they begin to get better. What is seen to be inevitable is somehow bearable, but the slow place of change quickly becomes intolerable. The irony is that Fianna Fáil Green Coalition was eviscerated at the polls for having got the country into a mess, while Fine Gael Labour have been thrashed for getting us out of it, more or less. Commentators <coughs> have variously explained the recent election results and current polls as signifying the impending demise of the party system, or as simply a sort of super by-election, in which the stakes being low in proportion to the satisfaction of giving authority a kick in the pants, the electorate indulges itself in protest without actually willing radical change. The signs are that it was more than that, not classic alienation, given the level of participation, not apathy either, but certainly more than gesture politics, 
if not an expression of complete disgust at the performance of all the current actors. Sinn Féin certainly profited from a protest vote, from the general dissatisfaction and the feeling of being hard done by on a prolonged period of belt tightening and hostility. But the level of support across the country also, more substantially, reflects consistent hard work at constituency level on local and national issues and some stellar parliamentary performances in opposition as the government gave a masterclass in self-abuse in the weeks before polling. It all goes to show what a trendy political brand can achieve without an economic policy which is endorsed by any serious economist or a fiscal policy in which the sums actually add up. The emergence of independence in such numbers and so widely distributed is a more interesting phenomenon as the symbol of the malaise in the body politic. Elected as they are on so many issues, some intensely local, some shared more widely, it is hard to see any pattern of coherence, any signpost to effective collective action. Independents, by definition, are independent of each other. And it's hard to see how a government, or even a convincing and constructive opposition, could be constructed from a doyle dominated by independents. And if they do manage to coalesce to the extent of having agreed policies and programs, they cease to be independent, and they begin to look suspiciously like the political parties they contemn. A more serious danger is that the rise of independence and what is largely an incoherent protest vote, partly a cry of pain, partly an expression of anger at the perceived incompetence of government, might be repeated or exceeded in the general election. But the answer to poor administration is not no government at all. And there is a danger that in an atmosphere of despair and confusion, a vacuum of power can provide a point of entry for the demagogue who promises certainty and salvation at minimum cost. I'm not suggesting, nor I am aware, that any lurks in the margins ready to come on stage. But voices crying in the wilderness can often raise expectations that there is a messiah around the corner. It is easy to promise maximum service at minimum cost by way of taxation. But even the Greeks know that utopia is only another word for nowhere. However, out of crisis comes opportunity. As one of Kostler's active fraternity of pessimists, skeptical of radical surgery in the body politic, I don't wish to preempt the conclusions of the distinguished experts who will address the school. But it does seem that at the heart of our political difficulties is a lack of engagement, especially by young people and those in the areas which have borne the brunt of austerity, emigration and lack of opportunity. This would seem to require some consideration of the ways in which young people receive and process information and of the various conversations that are maintained on social media on new methods of communication and their potential to inform and to mobilize support for programs and policies. Engagement needs to start at local and community level, which could best be affected by a transfer of substantial powers and responsibilities to a reinvigorated local government. Sadly, pending changes in this field are focused on administration and economy and the delivery of services and not on a vibrant and effective local democracy. And the proposals in the North are just as bad. Ireland suffers from having one of the most centralized systems of administration in Western Europe, which reduces all contact with the citizen, where indeed this takes place, to a bureaucratic transaction, devoid of debate, and shorn of all power to influence outcomes or to exercise choice. It would also take many of the parish pump issues out of the doyle, and leave room for more serious strategic consideration of issues of national importance. And if you want an argument for the strengthening of local government and making it really democratic, I think you, you look at events in the last week in Dublin. I'd rest my case on that, actually. It's desirable, too, to reduce executive control of the Rochtus 
exercised through the extent of the payroll vote in the whipping system. For government to be credible, it needs to be challenged constructively with real accountability achieved through transparency, open and robust debate, and a strong and well-resourced Arrakis committees. There needs to be a reduction in the power of governments to exercise patronage, with public appointments and appointments to judiciary and senior guardy being made in a way that is independent, transparent, and clearly based on merit rather than political preferment. And there's something wrong with the system in which senior civil servants are said to be reluctant to challenge doubtful policies or even afraid to dissent, even in private. There's a need to reinvigorate the senior public service, to improve quality, to redefine roles and responsibilities, to encourage honesty and integrity, and to restore an ethic of public service which would invoke the example of Whitaker and Nally of John Leyden and Peter Berry and the great McElligot, whose scathing minute to De Valera criticising his draft constitution is a classic of its kind. And even if necessary, Sir Thomas Moore, St Thomas he prefer, in speaking truth to power and telling ministers what they don't want to hear. Developments in the media, the 24-hour rolling news calling constantly for comment and rebuttal do not help either in encouraging a strategic approach to deep-seated problems of structure and political culture. The emphasis is on the event, on the short term, the political quick fix, with media and politicians feeding off each other and with public debate and policy formulated, dominated by whatever leads the national news on any given day. After a life cycle of a week or so, or at the most two weekends, the feeding frenzy dies down and the hunting pack moves on to another topic. Respect for the political process is not helped either by what I would call the paximalization of political interviewing, in which politicians of whatever hue are invariably presented as crooks dodging disclosure in an identity parade. It would be wise to not to get too hung up on structures and process to the eclipse of product and outcome. As Pope put it, it was Alexander, not Francis, <laughs> <laughs> for forms of government, let fools contest what air is best administered is best. And since the minister or the ambassador has invoked the concept of the fork in the road, perhaps the best advice the dedicated pessimist can offer government is to quote the great American philosopher, Yogi Berra, who said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> <laughs> it might even be the only conclusion to emerge from a week's passionate and informed debate. It's perhaps late in the proceedings to raise a rather fundamental question about the ambit of the school. The Garden School appears to confine the challenge to restore order and good government to a 26-county polity. In this, it merely reflects what appears to be a growing tendency in the chattering classes, the media, the establishment, and the general public to regard Northern Ireland as indeed a place apart, which has been sorted out by the Good Friday Agreement and the Constitutional Amendment left with a sigh of relief to float off into the sunset on its own. There is, for many, a mental map of the country which, like the explorer's charts, sees only empty space on the other side of the border. County Lyth is now the new northeast. A recent yellow warning broadcast by the Met Office forecast excessive rain in Munster, Leinster and Connaught in the counties of Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. <laughs> as if weather stopped at the border. <laughs> as if the elements switched off at Balik and Cross McGlen. <laughs> There's a subliminal message in the publicity extolling the merits of food produced in Irish farms, which subtly excludes produce from Northern Ireland. And the final indignity is the disembodied voice in the sat-nav which welcome, says, welcome to Ireland. 
halfway between Newry and Dundalk. <laughs> it is a supreme irony of an armed struggle with the purported aim of securing United Ireland that it has made the achievement of that objective substantially more problematic, having alienated more unionists from the project by the brutality of the campaign, while at the same time convincing an increasing number of Southerners that it mightn't be such a good idea after all, and certainly not a priority if in straitened times they are expected to pick up the tab to replace the annual diary from the British Treasury. Which brings us back by a commodious vicus of recirculation, as Joyce might say, to the Good Friday Agreement and the principle of consent enshrined there in an international treaty and to which the Ambassador had already made a reference. Not for the first time, this had been differentially glossed by the two Northern Ireland communities, by unionists as a guarantee against being absorbed against their will into a hostile polity, by Republicans as a staging post on the way to their ultimate destination. It's the old contrariness, which was the nail of Sunningdale, which Brian Faulkner hailed as a bulwark against unification, and Hugh Logue of the SDLP greeted as the tumbrel to carry them there. The additional irony is that the Catholics believe Faulkner and the Unionists believe the SDLP man. <laughs> what then is the import of the principle of consent, which by definition should carry a collateral right to withhold consent, when is it to kick in? By what majority and on what prospectus? And who's going to ask the people in the South? The Act provides for activation of the mechanism by the Secretary of State when it is judged to be sufficient support to ensure that the proposition would be carried in a referendum. But by how much? 50% plus one would merely create a mirror image of the present conflict with even less prospect of resolution. And to speculate on what the unknown quantity in 50% plus X can be can only be destabilizing. And who in all this is going to talk to the unemployed loyalist youths in East Belfast, the innocent victims of the collapse of a manufacturing economy, ill-prepared by the education system to take advantage of new opportunities in a knowledge-based economy, and having lost all faith in politics. Republicans, too, like the Chinese proverb, should be careful about what they wish for. Unity in the traditional form may be neither attainable nor desirable. It's perhaps encouraging that some of the wiser voices are beginning to talk in terms of an agreed Ireland rather than the starkly irredentist language of old. The concept of absolute sovereignty has taken a beating since the heyday of the nation state. The Good Friday Agreement had the emancipatory merit of unhitching the nation from the state of allowing national identity to flow across political boundaries which become less significant. It could also open the way to more imaginative ways of accommodating the aspirations and the mores of competing cultures on the island. The Good Friday Agreement is invoked by nationalists along with sundry human rights documents as a safeguard for the recognition and public expression of their Irish cultural identity. While, often, all too, uh, while all too often on the slightest whiff of provocation demanding that orange men suppress theirs. In Seamus Heaney's last public interview before his untimely and unexpected death in relation to the loyalist flag protest in Belfast, he said, let them fly what flags they like, before adding almost sotto voce that there wouldn't be a United Ireland anyway, which is an echo of the more strident and acerbic strictures addressed to unionists by Louis McNeese a generation and a half before, when he said, put out what flags you will, it is too late to save your souls with bunting. Echoing too John Hume's dismissal of flags as a staple item for diet for the working man, and the advice in cure at Troy to the victorious Greeks, preserve the shrines, show God's respect. Perhaps a more modest objective, echoing John Hume's ambition to unite people rather than territory, would be to envisage and then to engineer political and administrative structures on the island 
within which nationalists and unionists can live together in relative peace and amity, in reasonable security and mutual respect, with a decent standard of living and a care for the weak and vulnerable in society, cherishing diversity and protecting difference, and in harmony with our neighbours and the rest of the archipelago. If that could be achieved, it need not matter very much what sort of constitutional envelope it's packaged in. It would certainly bring us to the Lehman described by Seamus as the borderline of poetry between what you would like to happen and what will. And again, without preempting what might be said later in the week, that will all be made infinitely more difficult if the United Kingdom were to withdraw from Europe. Seamus gives us another remarkably prescient insight in crediting poetry, his Nobel laureate acceptance speech some years before the Good Friday Agreement, expressing his hopes for a reduction of conflict and the easing of ancient animosities in Northern Ireland. And I quote, Every dweller in the country must hope that the governments involved in this governance can devise institutions which allow partition to become something like a net on a tennis court, a demarcation allowing for agile give and take, for encountering and contending, prefiguring a future where the vitality which flowed in the beginning from those bracing words, enemies and allies, might finally derive from a less binary and altogether less binding vocabulary. End of the quote. Which is remarkably like, actually, the concept of a, an American historian of ethnicity, John Hyam, who said that the, the boundaries fences between minority groups in a society should be strong enough to provide security and permeable enough to allow for socialization. A main barrier to progress in Northern Ireland and more generally on the island is an obsession with the past and a clamant pursuit of absolute truth even in the most hopeless cases which is no more attainable than absolute and at times even relative justice. The now hackneyed, misquoted, overquoted hope and history rhyme can be read as a desire that hope would lift the burden of history, that society could look forward rather than fixedly back. Hope, all that remained in Pandora's box when all the demons had been released, should be forward-looking and non-recriminatory. The hope for self-healing too surely discouraged the endless picking at scabs, which, far from producing betterment, keep the wounds of past wars open and bealing. If you don't know what bealing is, ask Maria, <laughs> ask Maria Heaney. It's a subterranean, nasty wound. One has to tread gently here, for there are real victims and survivors who need to be treated with sensitivity and respect. They deserve what most of them haven't had, the best that society can offer by way of material help, support, psychological counselling, and the chance to tell their individual stories and have them recorded and to hear the narratives of others. They are entitled to hope for as much information as possible about the circumstances in which their loved ones died. But surely it's an added cruelty to raise hopes of certainty of absolute justice and the successful prosecution and conviction after so many years of those thought to be involved. In this I agree with the Attorney General John Larkin in his professional assessment of the unlikelihood of successful prosecutions and the disruptive effect on the body politic of continuing to do so. There is surely a case for drawing a line in the sand and moving on. We cannot mortgage the future to the past. A further difficulty <coughs> in interrogating the past is the lack of equity in the search, each side wanting to pursue selectively the perpetrators and the other. Republicans would pillory every offending soldier and policeman while excusing the excesses of their own competence. Unionists seek to expose and punish criminality by Republicans while tolerating or denying state involvement in a dirty war. There's also the problem of an inequality of arms in that while the official actors and their deeds are recorded in files and records 
which can be discovered and scrutinized when they're not arbitrarily withheld or conveniently lost. Their paramilitary opponents tended to operate in a paperless society. The ethical dilemmas relating to victimhood are timeless and irresolvable. Later in the burial at Thebes, you will hear Crayon's demand from the high moral ground that the wrongdoers and the wrong should not fare the same, and Antigone's anguished response that the dead do not begrudge the dead. In the end, in the north, there are too many like the two grieving widows, Protestant and Catholic, in O'Casey's play, on either side of a scales of sorrow, weighed down by the bodies of our suffering sons. Jonathan Phillips, former senior official in the Northern Ireland office, who was central to many of the negotiations in the peace process, suggests in a forthcoming book that Northern Ireland might draw inspiration from what happened in Spain after the death of Franco and the end of a regime which had been characterized by murder, torture and imprisonment and extreme brutality and bitterness on all sides. He said, this required a pact of forgetfulness, which would require people to say that while they recognized the pain and the difficulty of the past on all sides, there was a simple imperative for the current generation to build a new society and economy, leaving the detail of what happened to be reviewed with greater historical perspective and less personal animus in the years to come. There is, of course, the difficulty of history being written, rewritten and of deliberate obfuscation to suit contemporary political positions and of convenient bouts of historical amnesia. As is very slyly hinted at in Cure at Troy, where Philoctetus, the violent, unpredictable, uncontrollable outcast who happens to carry the armament necessary for victory, is reassured about his reception among the Greeks. He's told, the very people who go mad at the slightest show of force will be eaten out of your hand if you get them right and tell the story so as just to suit them. Or on the last lap now, you'd be glad to know. <laughs> <laughs> the liturgy of the school <coughs> requires us at the end of each day to turn our faces to the sun and pay homage to the memory and achievements of Seamus Heaney. And I do now follow that rubric gladly and with respect. The best way to recognize a poet is as a lover of language, what Borrow called using the Romani term la vengro, the master of words. We can continue to draw on his insights and his sensitive awareness of the human condition to help us understand and cope with the situation we find ourselves in. And we can keep his voice alive by quotation, as I have done several times in the course of this lecture. My own favourites are two short poems, The Hall Lantern and The Diviner, both of which exemplify the power of poetry in the search for truth and the vatic role of the poet. In the first, Diogenes searches for just one, one just man, holding up his lamp to scrutinise faces as the poet focuses his beam on the predicament of the common man in search of certainty or at least reassurance. A small light for small people, wanting no more of them than that they keep the wick of self-respect from burning out. And with Seamus's customary restraint and moderation, not having to blind them with illumination. The diviner represents the power of the creative artist to plumb the depths, to detect subterranean movements and trends indiscernible to the average, but which the antennae of the poet can pick up, decipher and rebroadcast. The pluck came sharp as a sting. The rod jerked with precise convulsions. Spring water suddenly broadcasting through a green hazel its secret stations. The bystanders would ask to have a try. He handed them the rod without a word. It lay dead in our grasp till nonchalantly he gripped expectant wrists. The hazel stirred. Seamus was our dowser, 
with a friendly hand on the elbow and a cheerful nudge, giving us new insights into the unknown and stimulating us to use our own imagination. The programme asks us to consider both the loss and the legacy. The loss, of course, is profound, especially for Mary and the children, for his brothers and sisters and a wide circle of friends. But the legacy, the legacy is enduring, inexhaustible and priceless. There has been the loss of his wise and gracious presence and of the poems now never to be written. But as long as language lives, as long as people care for words, so long as we can quote him, Seamus lives on as guide, philosopher and friend. I leave almost the last word to Shakespeare, who as well as being universally quotable is conveniently out of con- uh, copyright. <laughs> in another context, he wrote about in one of his own sonnets, so long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this. And this gives life to thee. So long indeed. To Seamus, I say, in the Doric of the Ulster countryside where we both grew up, so long, old friend, so long.